uh, non-contingently um, and the stim stimuli were attention and food for three individuals with developmental disabilities um, whose problem behaviours were maintained by those um, reinforcers. And here is what the data look like. Uh, and, and please bear in mind that this is just the application or the, the, the fixed time or variable time delivery of either attention or food, and that's it. No, nothing else happened in this study. So one, one, and I will come on to talk about this anyway, but one of the big advantages of using non-contingent reinforcement is that it's such an easy thing to do. Uh, provided you identify stimuli with known reinforcing properties. So this is what happens or can happen if you simply provide access to stimuli that, that have known reinforcement properties on a fixed time um, interval and you do nothing else. And you see in this case decreases uh, measured by um, response per minute in the problem behavior of three individuals. So it it's can be a pretty powerful strategy, even though it's a really, really easy thing to do. Um, now, what about negative reinforcement? Uh, now, of course, negative reinforcement is the removal of something, uh, and that might be um, a, a break or the removal of an instruction. So in this case, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, these three authors um, delivered uh, a break from instructional requests non-contingently for two individuals with autism in order to decrease their problem behavior that was maintained by um, escape from or a break from instructional requests. And they started initially with a, a fixed time interval of 10 seconds. Uh, so some, so they, these individuals were getting a break every 10 seconds, then they were getting a break every 20 seconds, then they were getting a break every 30 seconds and so on. So the schedules thinned uh, gradually over time. Um, and in addition to reductions in problem behavior, they also found that they, there was increased compliance for these individuals. <clears throat> now, some of you may be thinking, uh, giving a break every 10 seconds initially doesn't sound like a very practical thing to do in a school situation. Because if you're giving a break every 10 seconds, then it's highly unlikely that you're going to be doing anything meaningful in terms of um, uh, providing learning opportunities in the intervening eight or nine seconds. And, and indeed, that's often an argument for not using uh, non-contingent reinforcement in the context of a break. Essentially, the argument is, well, if I do that, then I'll be giving someone a break all of the time. Um, and, and that's true. But uh, but again, let, let's think about the uh, the, the the logic of this and, and the uh, practical application of this. If you're working with someone whose problem behavior is such that they're not accessing learning opportunities anyway, um, and you know that the problem behavior is maintained by escape from demands, it follows logically that if you just stop the demands, you give very, very, very frequent breaks, then problem behavior ought to just stop and drop away. Now, the, 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 the secret though, the, the, the trick to this is uh, to gradually thin the schedule or, or um, make, perhaps not gradually, but fairly quickly thin the schedule such that you can reintroduce learning opportunities quite quickly. But if you have to balance uh, the, the, the possibility that individuals are gonna engage in significant problem behavior that's gonna deny them learning opportunities against, decreasing problem behavior to manageable limits and then gradually reintroducing learning opportunities, then why wouldn't you want to do this? Um, here's uh, the data from that paper. Um, and what you see in the top two panels are the problem behaviors uh, reducing. Um, and they actually compared non-contingent escape with the differential uh, negative reinforcement of other behavior. And in the bottom panel, you see um, increases in compliance. Uh, after it, the introduction of uh, non-contingent escape. So again, pretty powerful data sets for a fairly easy intervention. Now, in terms of automatic reinforcement, um, here's a paper that was published in 2003. In this paper, uh, they demonstrated that um, 
providing access to uh, non-contingent stimuli that uh, had known automatic reinforcement properties uh, decreased self-injurious behavior, SIB. And the, the, the stimulus they used was just to give access to highly preferred leisure items such that individuals could manipulate them physically. So they, you know, tac tactile um, stimuli. Um, and it was sufficient to do that to lead to reductions in problem behavior. And this is just providing someone with an object that they can manipulate. Um, and here's what the data look like. Um, and these are for two individuals. Uh, you have uh, SIB in baseline, which is actually highly variable, particularly for the second uh, individual. Then they provide access to the uh, object to manipulate. You see high levels of object, object manipulation, which is the open markers uh, that are high in the experimental condition and self-injurious behavior drops to much lower levels in the experimental condition. And again, just by giving access to um, a preferred stimulus that individuals can manipulate. So a very, very easy thing to do. Now, uh, having said it's really easy, there are some key elements that enhance the effectiveness of using uh, non-contingent reinforcement. The first is that the amount and the quality of the stimuli with known reinforcement uh, effectiveness um, has to be significant. So you would have to provide the stimulus uh, fairly frequently at first um, and in sufficient quantity um, and quality for it to uh, compete with the possible effects of engaging in problem behavior to get access to the same reinforcer. Um, you should procedurally use extinction when you use non-contingent reinforcement. Um, and, what, and what I mean by that is that uh, if you're using a fixed time interval of 30 seconds, for example, and at the end of 30 seconds, you deliver a stimulus non-contingently, for the other 29 seconds, you are placing problem behavior on extinction. Now, I appreciate that's not always easy or possible to do, but if you're able to do that, then that uh, significantly enhances the effectiveness of non-contingent uh, reinforcement. Um, and it's also recommended that you vary the available stimuli that you use uh, to reduce the problems of changing preferences, which can occur, as you probably know, uh, through the result of um, satiation. Um, so that, and that's how you would manipulate uh, motivating operations using either satiation of stimuli or deprivation of stimuli. So it's also important that you have a range of uh, available stimuli that you can use that uh, have been shown to have, um, you know, the same reinforcing effectiveness. Um, but of course, to, in order to identify that, you need uh, to have got that information through the use of a functional analysis. So that when you're looking at a problem behavior, the functional analysis tells you what the, the function is, therefore what the maintaining reinforcer is, uh, therefore, what potential stimuli you can use to get give access to the same uh, type of um, st stimulation. Uh, so functional analysis is really mandated for using uh, non-contingent reinforcement effectively. Um, the, here's a study that uh, demonstrates the importance of the, the, the schedule when you de deliver non-contingent reinforcement. Um, if the, if the uh, delivery uh, is similar in, in baseline, that is to say, if you are getting access to attention for engaging in problem behavior, let's say every five minutes, and you deliver um, a, another stimulus, uh, sorry, if you deliver a, attention every five minutes non-contingently, that's, that's not gonna be very effective. It has to be much more frequent then you would get access to the same reinforcer in baseline conditions. So you need a high density uh, when, when you start to do this, or, or certainly higher than you would during uh, baseline. Um, and the authors suggest three uh, procedures for increasing effectiveness. Uh, obviously you um, identify uh, stimuli with known reinforcing properties and you increase the delivery of that when you start with this. Um, 
you use an obviously different schedule at treatment onset, which not only is um, a, an increase in delivery, but it's a clearly different schedule. Uh, and it also, they, they recommend using differential reinforcement of other behavior along with uh, non-contingent reinforcement in order to decrease the potential that um, problem behavior could be reinforced with the stimulus that you're providing non-contingently. Um, actually, let, let me just go back and say that, uh, you know, I said at the beginning that I thought non-contingent reinforcement was a very bad term for what we're talking about. Um, what, what the term I would prefer to use is that I, I would substitute the word reinforcement for the stimulus I'm actually using. So rather than non-contingent reinforcement, I would talk about uh, non-contingent attention or non-contingent escape or non-contingent access to an activity. That's how I prefer to talk about this as an intervention. I wouldn't describe it as non-contingent reinforcement. Most applications start with a fixed time schedule, uh, but of course you can use a variable time schedule uh, and you could switch from a fixed time to a variable time schedule anyway. Um, how you establish the initial uh, schedule is, is important. Um, and an easy thing to do is just make it very, very dense and very, very frequent at the beginning, um, which, which is how you, you know, that's how you would do it arbitrarily. Uh, but a, a more empirical way of doing it would be to calculate the rate of access to reinforcement in baseline. That is to say that the number of times problem behavior actually contacts reinforcement. Um, and then use that as your uh, starting point for calculating what uh, schedule to use. Um, but obviously you set it as a much more dense and much more frequent. Um, but then once you start doing this, you, you need to thin the schedules that you use because you can't realistically uh, provide attention to someone every 10 seconds for a long period of time or provide as, as, um, escape, sorry, um, a break to individuals every 10 seconds for a long period of time. So there needs to be uh, a, a way that you have predetermined to how you would thin the, the schedules that you're using. Um, and of course, you wouldn't really want to do this until you had uh, affected a reduction in problem behavior. So when your data tell you that problem behavior is reduced, then you can think about uh, thinning the schedule and you can do that either by constant time increases, so maybe adding five seconds or 10 seconds each time, uh, proportional time increases, maybe doubling it each time, or make your determination on a session by session basis according to what the data tell you. And that would be my preferred method. Um, here are some additional considerations to think about. Uh, establish a terminal criteria for doing this, um, because you don't want to, for example, tell a teacher to provide um, non-contingent attention every minute and then just leave them to do that for weeks, if not months. So there needs to be criteria for when that stops. And it could be that problem behavior has reduced to a certain level or possibly to zero. Um, and, and you know, when, when you're making such a consideration, weigh the advantages against the disadvantages uh, before deciding to use non-contingent reinforcement. Uh, so let me just tell you what the advantages and disadvantages are. Uh, the advantages are that it's very easy to apply based uh, relative to a contingency based procedure. Um, it helps create a positive learning environment because if the individual is getting uh, free and frequent access to the stuff they really want, uh, that's a great thing for them in the classroom or wherever they happen to be. Um, if you combine it with extinction, and, and it's just really recommended that you do, then that, then the use of non-contingent access to something uh, reduces the possibility of extinction-induced response bursts, the so-called extinction burst. Um, and using uh, non-contingent access to some stimulus uh, may lead to the adventitious reinforcement of other appropriate behaviors, which is a good thing. Here are the disadvantages, though. If you have free access, uh, you may not be motivated to engage in adaptive or appropriate behavior. Um, you know, I'm in a classroom, I was engaging in self-injurious behavior. Someone's identified that that was maintained by attention. They start giving me attention. I can now just sit there and wait for attention to be provided to me without having to do anything. That's, that's what this is about.
Um, and and the, uh, the opposite problem to the advantage, one of the advantages is that if you are providing uh, non-contingent access to a stimulus, you could adv adventitiously reinforce inappropriate behaviors and strengthen and maintain those. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you're using non-contingent escape, then that can dis disrupt the instructional process. But then my argument uh, to that to a teacher might be, well, do you want them to sit there and engage in self-injurious behavior and not access learning opportunities anyway? Or shall we just implement something that's going to bring problem behavior to near zero levels and then uh, start to gradually reintroduce uh, tasks and demands? Um, and that's an intervention that is broadly referred to as demand fading. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next antecedent um, intervention. This is the high probability request sequence um, or high P request sequence. It's also being referred to as behavioral momentum um, and, and a couple of other terms, which I'll mention in a minute. And what this involves is a presentation of easy to follow requests um, and they're easy to follow because you know uh, through the individual's history and the data you have that they are likely to follow these requests when you when you ask them so they're requests that have a high probability of compliance so high p requests and then after a series of high p requests you then uh, put in a, a low probability request, so a target request. Um, and the logic here and, and the data actually suggest that after a series of um, high probability requests that the individual has complied with, they're much more likely to comply with a low probability request than if you just provided the low probability request um, initially. So again, it works by creating um, an abolishing operation. So it reduces the value of the reinforcement for non-compliance to low probability requests um, and reduces problem behavior typically associated with low probability requests, um, well, whatever they might be. So it might be general non-compliance or it might be um, escape or running away from the task or the request. Um, it provides a non-aversive procedure for improving compliance. Um, by diminishing or decreasing escape maintained problem behavior. Um, and it also may have the effect of decreasing excessive slowness in responding. Uh, so you will, you will decrease uh, latency to responding because you, you're kind of building momentum by um, asking things that are so re easy to do. Uh, so people start responding um, and that can help build um, uh, speed and fluency of responding. So procedurally, what typically happens is that you would start by selecting between two and five, and I would probably err on the side of more rather than less, short tasks uh, which the individual has a history of complying with. Um, and also things that they can perform quickly. So it might be uh, answering a question that has a one or two word answer or something like that. Um, so you present the, the, these high P requests as a sequence immediately before then requesting uh, a target um, request. So something that um, is more difficult, that has a lower probability of the individual responding. It might be um, uh, uh, something on acquisition. It's a, it's a target skill. Um, but you present the low P request in exactly the same manner that you presented the high P requests. So here are some, uh, here, well, here's a, the, a study that first described the use of this high P request sequence, at least formally. So Engelman and Colvin, um, that, that was the first formal description of using this procedure. They called it the hard task procedure for compliance training. Um, and it has been subsequently used in a whole range of different ways for what's broadly known as compliance training. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that the, there are a variety of different terms that have been used to refer to this intervention, uh, and that includes interspersed requests, pre-task requests, behavioral momentum I've already uh, mentioned, but, but most commonly is the high P request sequence. Um, how to effectively use such a uh, procedure? 
Um, well, in, certainly in terms of the high P requests, they need to be things selected from the individual's current repertoire. So they can't be things uh, that are new or in acquisition. They have to be things that the individual can do. They're easy to do. They're easy to respond to. You can present the request rapidly. The individual can respond rapidly. Um, and it's also important that even though the high P requests are designed to be requests that the individual is able to comply with, that you acknowledge and reinforce uh, compliance uh, at that stage of using this procedure. And, and use you know, potent reinforcers in order to do that, because what you're working on is uh, developing compliance and decreasing non-compliance for these uh, low P requests. So I, I said that the high P request should be within the learner's current repertoire. Uh, an empirical way of doing that might be to, uh, to take some data and choose those uh, that are responded to with 70% or more of compliance. So that might be a way of defining your high P requests. Um, and and they, you should be able to present them quickly and the individual should be able to respond to them quickly. So a very short duration of occurrence. Um, so you, you would do this fairly quickly and, and unfortunately I don't have a video to show you. If I couldn't find a video. Maybe I should have made a video of myself trying to do this. But you, you rattle off these high P requests fairly quickly, acknowledging um, and reinforcing compliance as you're doing it. And then once you've got responding occurring nicely, then you throw in your first low P request. Um, and if that's responded to and the individual complies with that request, then you can use your more, more potent reinforcer for compliance at that point. Um, okay, I already mentioned that you need to acknowledge compliance immediately. Uh, of course, when you're using the high P request sequence, you, you, you can't really be stopping and giving access to um, tangible stimuli. So if, if you can, it's better to use uh, social uh, reinforcement in the form of um, praise, assuming that functions as a reinforcer. But that's by far the easiest thing to do. Um, but it may not be enough for some individuals, um, particularly if motivation for escape is high. Um, so it may be that you have to find some other uh, reinforcers that can be delivered quickly and um, accessed and or consumed quickly. Um, but as with the other antecedent intervention that we talked about, you need to uh, work out in advance how this will be faded over time. Um, and you want to gradually fade the high P requests as the low probability uh, compliance with low probability requests increases. Uh, and ideally you want to reduce the, and reduce those until the ratio should be pretty much what would you would expect to happen in the instruction environment, whether that be a classroom or a center or whatever it happens to be. Okay, so that was a rapid uh, trawl through um, uh, the high P request sequence. The last one I want to talk about is functional communication training. And how functional communication works, um, and the, the kind of clue is in the title really, is that what you want to do is you want to establish an appropriate communication behavior that replaces and competes with problem behavior um, that's evoked by an establishing operation. And, and for me, and not everyone will necessarily agree with me, and I know colleagues that won't agree with me, but functional communication training, uh, capital F, capital C, capital T, is really just um, a packaged uh, application of the differential reinforcement of alternative behavior. Um, you know, there, there is no real difference between them because what you're doing with functional communication training is you're uh, developing an alternative communication response um, to diminish problem behavior. You, you're teaching a replacement behavior um, that has the function of getting access to the same reinforcer instead of problem behavior. Uh, so the problem behavior may be that um, someone is sitting in a classroom and they are um, being aggressive towards their peers. And the function of that behavior is attention from the teacher. So the teacher is frequently coming over and reprimanding them and telling them to stop doing it and so on. Um, now, because the function is attention, if you can teach and reinforce another way of asking for attention, 
So it's a, it's a communication response that's asking for the reinforcer of attention. Um, then theoretically, uh, if you do it right, um, and we'll talk about uh, how to be effective doing this, um, now they should be using that strategy rather than aggression because that strategy is at least as effective, but preferably more effective at gaining attention than the previous one. And, and there are a variety of different responses you can teach because this is a communication response. You could think about um, things like vocalization, signs, the use of communication boards, uh, word or pictures, uh, vocal output systems, gestures, and so on. So any way in which you can teach someone to, uh, to mand uh, for the reinforcer would be an appropriate thing to do for functional communication training. Um, but it's, it's a two-step process uh, because you need to teach something that accesses the same reinforcer's problem behavior. You have to know what the, the function of the problem behavior is. So therefore, the, the first step in this process is to complete um, a functional assessment or functional analysis to identify um, what the reinforcer is maintaining the problem behavior. And once you know that, you can then identify something to teach the individual that would also allow them to access the same reinforcer. Now, interestingly, this, this paper that was published in 1985, uh, which is a few years after the paper published by Brian Uata on the use of experimental functional analysis, um, they, they, you, they, they described what they did as a functional analysis, but they did it in a very different way. They, it was, um, there were no consequences in their functional analysis conditions. They simply set up conditions that they thought would occasion problem behavior, but without delivering any consequences. So in the attention condition, um, essentially the individuals were deprived of attention during the condition. Um, in the escape condition, uh, they provided access to sorry they they um put top uh demands on individuals in order to see whether it would occasion problem behavior so they did it in a slightly different way so it's almost worth reading the paper just to look at the difference between how they did it and the water did it but nevertheless you need to identify the reinforcer initially um and then to do this effectively you need to have dense schedules of reinforcement for the um this alternative behavior that you've taught or you're trying to teach uh, now again, again let's think of the logic of this if previously i was punching the child next to me in order to get access to attention and now uh, you have taught me that if i raise my hand um, to get attention that the teacher will come over and get attention then theoretically i, I can now just raise my hand instead but if raising my hand doesn't get me attention as effectively or as fre frequently as hitting the child next to me, which is almost guaranteed to get attention, especially if I hit the child hard enough, then I would just go back to hitting the child. So it's really important that whatever you do, whatever you teach, uh, you ensure that it contacts access to reinforcement on a very dense schedule, at least initially. Um, you, you ought not to use, or at least you ought to be very sparing in your use of verbal prompts. Uh, when you start doing this. Um, it, ideally, it ought to be something that's already in the repertoire or partially in the repertoire. But if you have to use verbal prompts in order to get to engage, for example, to get me to raise my hand, then uh, you ought not to use too many and decrease them very quickly. Um, you can combine it with other additional reduction procedures. And there's a study that compares those, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and again, you need to thin the schedule such that you know i put my hand up um you, you give me attention every time i put my hand up and it gets to a point where i put my hand up and the teacher may say neil i can see you have your hand up i'll come over and attend to you in a second uh, and that way build in a delay and start to thin the schedule uh, and so on um okay I, I i've already said this it's really 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 important that whatever you teach um accesses uh minimally uh, the same density of reinforcement, but, but ideally uh, the, the, the reinforcement a far denser schedule than was available for engaging in problem behavior. Otherwise, I'll just go back to engaging in problem behavior because it's more effective and it's more efficient. Um, 
okay so that i talked about the importance of not using verbal prompts or decreasing verbal prompts although I'm, I'm acknowledging that you may need to use verbal prompts initially in order to prompt me to put my hand up even though i can put my hand up um, but as soon as uh, that response is more heavily embedded within my repertoire then you can reduce and, and actually preferably eliminate uh, the prompts um, and also it, it, it removes kind of the prompt dependence that we may engender by uh, using verbal prompts in the first place. Now, I, I, I mentioned that it, um, its effectiveness can be increased if you combine it with other behavior reduction procedures. Um, and, the, and the obvious one to, to include with functional communication training is extinction. Um, now, it's not always possible to do that. I, I appreciate that. And it's not, if it's not possible to do, it's not possible to do. But if it is possible to do, um, then combining it with extinction will, will be a very effective thing to do. Now, the, the denser the schedule of reinforcement you use for the alternative, uh, the less likely you'll be concerned about having to ignore other, other elements of problem behavior and therefore using extinction. Now, I, I wanted to talk about this study because it, it, it's kind of interesting in an, from an ethical perspective, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, but it is an old study, uh, so it's um, you know, 22 years old now. Um, but uh, you know, function, when functional communication training was first written about in the mid 80s, there, were, there was a flurry of research and many people adopted functional communication training as uh, the strategy they were using in classrooms and so on. And, and the, these researchers uh, wanted to evaluate whether functional communication training in, it, in and of itself uh, was an effective procedure or whether you did actually need to include other uh, behavior reduction procedures with it in order to get it to be effective. So they conducted this study. Uh, they looked at 21 children and adolescents between the age of 2 and 16, all had developmental disabilities. They all engaged in problem behaviors maintained by social reinforcement. Uh, so that was one of the defining characteristics of participant inclusion in the study. Uh, but the problem behaviors varied. Uh, there was self-injurious behavior, SIB, aggression, PICA, or some people say PICA. Uh, I'm not sure what the Oxford English Dictionary says in terms of how you should pronounce it. I've always pronounced it PICA. Um, for those of you that don't know what PICA is, it's the um, ingestion of inedible substances. So you put things into your mouth that you shouldn't put into your mouth and you eat them, swallow them. Uh, and property destruction was another problem behavior. Okay, so interestingly, what they found was that just using functional communication training was actually ineffective. Um, now, I, sh I should say there were, there, were, there were some limits or limitations, I should say, on what they did in this study and subsequent studies of found different results to this, but, but nonetheless, it's interesting that uh, just using functional communication training for these individuals was ineffective, actually to an increase in problem behavior. Uh, now, I, I don't know whether that was as a result of um, uh, procedural integrity issues, treatment integrity issues. I, I can't remember how much control the, re the researchers had over the implementation of FCT, so there may be some explanations for that. But um, the important thing here is that when you include the use of extinction, uh, you, do, you get a, a massively significant increase in treatment effect. Um, but, but why I mentioned this has an ethical uh, dimension is that the, the last one on this list is if you use a punishment procedure with FCT, you get an even more significant um, improvement in, in the use of uh, the, the combined procedures. Uh, now, the, the, this is an ethical issue because, as I hope you know, um, behavior analysts eschew the use of punishment um, except under fairly, fairly rare um, and challenging circumstances. Um, so essentially, uh, behavior analysts don't use punishment um, unless uh, the, the problem behavior itself is such a significant uh, life-threatening or um, learning opportunity limited issue that it's significantly, very significantly impacting on the quality of life of this individual. So that'd be the first thing. Um, and secondly, uh, unless you can demonstrate that other reinforcement-based procedures have been tried and failed. 
So those are really the only conditions under which behaviour analysts would even countenance the use of a punishment procedure. Uh, but there are many that just wouldn't use punishment under any circumstances. Um, but please bear in mind that um, punishment is, is a very loaded term. And when you use the word punishment, it conjures up all sorts of images in, in people's minds. <coughs> but a punishment procedure, <coughs> excuse me, is, is functionally defined. And, and it's simply uh, a situation where following a behavior, some kind of stimulus is either presented or removed, leading to a reduction in problem behavior, the future probability of problem behavior. So saying no to someone that's engaging in a tantrum, for example, if that's effective, that is a punishment procedure, but that isn't, that's not uh, the kind of aversive punishment uh, procedure people often think about when we mention the word punishment. Anyway, um, but, but for, for now, I think using it with extinction is, is you know, what, what the field thinks is the most effective and most ethical thing to do. Uh, like the other procedures, it's important that you engage in uh, schedule thinning, um, and uh, there are a number of different ways you can do that, and I've talked about some of them before, but it's important that you don't even think about starting to thin the schedule until the, the alternative communication response is very firmly part of the individual's repertoire, and, and they are engaging in the alternative communication response far more than they are engaging in the, um, the problem behavior in order to get access to the same reinforcement. That's the point at which you start to think about how to thin the schedule of reinforcement. Um, okay, so actually what the, the guidelines say they're, they're not the same as the ones you would use for non-contingent reinforcement. Um, it's important that the alternative communication response remains uh, sensitive to the evocative function of the establishing operation. Um, so you have to be very careful and sparing in, in and ensuring that individuals don't satiate to the reinforcer that you use for the alternative communication response because then it'll simply lose it, its uh, its reinforcing potency um, and at that point recovery of problem behavior could occur. Um, Greg Hanley and colleagues back in 2001 they, they made various recommendations for uh, thinning the schedule related to functional communication training uh, and they say, as everyone says, I think, you know, start using a dense fixed interval schedule of reinforcement. Um, and after the response is established and only after the response is established, gradually thin the, um, the fixed interval schedule or change it to a variable interval schedule. Um, and there are a whole uh, raft of external cues uh, that you could uh, also use to indicate when reinforcement is available. 